Hello and welcome to the 166th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a quick flare screen across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's up, Matt? Um, it's been a while since I've seen you. Oh, wait, no, it's just been three hours. That's uh, that's the beauty of, uh, of us living in Nashville. We can have dinner together and talk about the show. Absolutely. Unfortunately, <laughs> Co- Coach and I live like half each other, like half a mile away from each other as the crow flies, but there is, n- there is no direct road whatsoever. So it takes about 15 minutes to drive to his house. It's literally a flare screen away. Yeah. Like he's not lying when he says that. So, alas, the mighty Harpeth is the uh, river that runs through it. But, uh, well, we can talk football and literature uh, with the third amigo in the second city. A man who is interested in a pig named Floyd this weekend. It's our intrepid (laughs) blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. Yeah, rivalry week in the Big Ten. That's all I got. All right. Uh, well, guys, a uh, lot to get to. We've got this reformation, some deep roots coming up later. We'll start with some quick slants, though. Uh, Josh, we'll throw it out to you first. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that game for a big pig trophy. Iowa heads up to Minneapolis. Both teams are three and one. Coming off their first defeats of the season, Iowa, the heartbreaker, self inflicted wound left and right against Wisconsin. Minnesota. Uh, they went out to Maryland last time out, and they lost 42-13 to because Maryland invented this play called the Jet Sweep that the Gophers had never seen before. But uh, both teams have a bye week to get ready for this one. Um, Iowa fans feel like the team actually comes out really bad after a bye week, feels like nothing got accomplished. Um, my guess is that has more to do with the team having two weeks to prepare for what is never an imaginative offense. Uh, Minnesota is, well, they've got a freshman quarterback, and it's kind of reflected on that. They're 104th in passing yards, 27th at scoring, uh, or excuse me, 88th at scoring, 27 points per game. They're top 20, though, in defense, 17.3 points per game. Iowa has a little bit better defense, 13 points per game allowed. That's fifth best in the country. They are delightfully a tick below average, both passing, 73rd in the country, and rushing, 78th in the country, Uh, they are producing 25 points per game. That's 97th in the country. That has to do with a ton of empty red zone trips. It's been a bugaboo for the Hawkeyes the last few years. And this is a huge game for these two teams because, A, Wisconsin has a really tough schedule, so there's still a bit of a chance especially for Iowa, who has an easy schedule, to maybe get really lucky, and Wisconsin drops a few. But more realistically, um, Iowa won a bowl game last year. They won a lot of trophy games, but they still had a pretty mediocre record. They want to try and improve that, try and get a little bit of momentum as a program because the schedule rotation shifts, and they're going to have – just monster schedules the next few years. This was kind of their last best chance to maybe get an 8, 9, 10 win type season. Uh, Minnesota, on the other hand, of course, P.J. Flex second year. Missed out on a bowl game last year. They don't want that to happen this season. Protected home field against one of their big rivals would be huge for them. A lot on the line in not necessarily title implications, but a meaningful game for both programs. All right. Well, Josh, something you did on our recap pod from earlier this week is you took a look at two of the smaller conferences in FBS football. And uh, with it being the end of the first trimester of the season, I wanted to do uh, sort of a look in report card for uh, both the American and the Mountain West. Uh, I'll start in the American, uh, specifically in the East Division, which is home to all three remaining unbeaten teams from this conference. Cincinnati, UCF, and South Florida are all unblemished to this point in the season. The biggest surprise is clearly Cincinnati, who are off to a 5 0 start for the first time since 2012. The key to their success has been an excellent defense, number two in the country in scoring defense, number one in pass efficiency defense. UCF still has that fantastic offense spearheaded by Mackenzie Milton, and so far, USF has ridden the momentum off of that big early season victory over Georgia Tech to a 4 0 start. 
Temple is one of the teams that I cannot for the life of me figure out this year. They opened the season by losing to FCS Villanova, yet somehow also managed to win on the road at Maryland when Maryland was undefeated. East Carolina also started the year off with a loss to an FCS school, in this case, North Carolina A&T, but they've beaten the Tar Heels and Old Dominion. And if you remember, Old Dominion beat Virginia Tech, and so by the transitive property, East Carolina is better than Virginia Tech. Anyway, uh, UConn, as mentioned on this podcast before, has a historically bad defense. They are on pace to give up the most points per game in the history of college football. Out West in the American, it's a complete toss-up right now. The preseason favorite Memphis is way behind the eight ball. They are, they have two conference losses already, including a bizarre dismantling at the hands of Tulane last Friday. Their lone bright spot has been Daryl Henderson, who leads the country going away in rushing. Houston has yet to play a conference game, but has put up an insane number of points, over 50 per game. Their lone loss this season was at Lubbock in a sh- big shootout where they lost 63-49. to 49. Tulane was a team coming into the season that we thought might take a step forward, and in some ways they have. I mean, they just beat Memphis, but they've also lost to, a, you know, I guess an average UAB team as well as two major conference teams so far. SMU had a real tough stretch to open the season at North Texas versus TCU and at Michigan. And obviously those three all ended in losses. They came back, however, to stun Navy 31 to 30. So they are technically undefeated in conference. Um, Navy, uh, speaking of, is another team that I can't quite figure out, despite being the exact same team they've been for the past two decades. They lost a track meet at Hawaii to open the season and have also lost to SMU, but they also managed to beat Memphis, who we all thought was good. Tulsa's lone win came against Central Arkansas, and since then, it's been bad news all around. I, they've got one shot at winning a game for the rest of the season, and that is against those hapless Huskies from stores. <sighs> anyway, that's the American coach. Uh, what's happening around uh, in the SEC this, this weekend in the undercard games? Well, the undercard games are actually going to be pretty good. Uh, the only one that's going to be a snooze test really is Ole Miss, UL Monroe, which if you've seen Ole Miss play defense, it really might not be a snooze fest, but I'm not going to preview it. Uh, the first game I'm going to preview is obviously my dogs. It's homecoming in Athens. Uh, it's a 6.30 p.m. Central Time kick. Uh, Vanderbilt comes in. They are looking for some answers. Um, it's hard to really critique Vanderbilt's last game because when you see something as serious as what happened to Christian Abercrombie um, happen, it's really difficult to play a good game after that. And and I certainly understand uh, what, you know, what happens. I, I don't think I've ever seen a team play well after something like that happens. So um, Vanderbilt's still an extremely talented team, and you can't really judge what happened last week, um, a close game with TSU um, because, because of what happened to Abercrombie. Abercrombie actually has movement, but he's still in critical condition um, after he collapsed on Saturday. So, um He's making some minor improvements, but he's still got a ways to go. Uh, it's going to be – I think it's going to be a competitive affair here. Um, I'm not sure that Georgia is, is in any danger of losing this game. I think they are uh, – I think they're going to win pretty handily, but I think it's going to be competitive first half. <clears throat> Second half, you're going to see Georgia's depth really take over and and go. So uh, the other games within this conference are um, are going to be fun to watch. You know, another another big matchup, uh, an Eastern Division matchup, uh, Missouri and South Carolina. Um, you know, South Carolina is licking their licking their wounds so far. You know, they've they've taken two uh, really big losses on the chin to uh, Kentucky and Georgia <clears throat> within the division. So they have to get this one to Missouri, or they might, uh, or their battle with Tennessee might be for for last place. But uh, Drew Locke comes into the game just red hot, 101 of uh, 161. So they've actually attempted 161 passes at this point in the season, um, which is um, it's too shy of what uh, Ole Miss has attempted. So uh, Drew Locke is uh, a, he's a special guy. He's going to be he's going to be a Sunday player for sure. Uh, he's definitely got the arm talent. He's definitely got the he's definitely got the juice. Also. Uh, be careful with Missouri. Uh, don't sleep on their run game. Larry Roundtree has got uh, almost 300 yards rushing. He hasn't scored a lot. Uh, he's only scored twice, but he's got 55 carries and 293 yards on the season. 
Um, he's he's looking to be an effective piece of this offense as they try to maintain some sort of balance. Um, and then, all, of course, Emmanuel Hall, this is number one target. And and uh, so it's going to be offense versus offense in this one. I, I think it's going to be a high-scoring affair. Um, it's going to be a, another, you know, another quarterback duel. I know that's, you know, it's, it's, this is kind of the week for that. You know, your, your best quarterbacks in the conference are going up against each other. Uh, Drew Locke, <clears throat> I wouldn't really call Jake Bentley the best right now, but coming into the season, he was considered one of the best. And then, of course, Kyle Shermer and Jake Fromm, uh, and, or the Jake Fromm Justin Fields duo. Um, so look, I, I think Missouri's going to come away on top there. Uh, they are actually favored by one and a half, and I think they're going to more than cover. Um, Ole Miss, UL Monroe. Um, that's going to be a score fest, so I'm not worried about that one. And then uh, Auburn, Mississippi State, so I will mention that as well. Uh, Mississippi State, again, uh, kind of like South Carolina, they're licking their wounds coming into this game. Nick Fitzgerald uh, just, <clears throat> I don't want to say got exposed, but he got exposed, and uh, it's, it's not pretty for him um, right now. And, and this Mississippi State team is trying to figure out what they can do to pick up the pieces here. Um, Auburn's ironically looking for the same thing they they've kind of struggled offensively um you know they've uh they're struggling to find a run game really you know it's it's all kind of going through Jarrett Stidham um and and uh you know trying to keep him protected and try to keep him uh where he can throw down the field they're not scoring as much as we think and 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 thank goodness for their defense or they wouldn't be four and one right now um and uh and so they, they've, their defensive line has played actually outplayed Clemson's. So right now I would consider at this moment Auburn's is better than Clemson's um, at this moment. Now that's not saying that that could change on a dime, but at this moment they are better. So uh, that'll be that'll actually be a really fun game to watch. Two teams that are really searching for their offensive identity and, and kind of trying to figure out what they do well and then build around that. So my biggest um, problem with with Auburn this year has been the fact that. This is the worst offensive line they've had in quite a while. I feel like Jared Stidham is not getting nearly as enough time. Uh, They're not getting any push time. in the run game either. And, yeah, exactly, getting zero push in the run game. And when you lose on Johnson, a guy who can break through tackles and make more guys miss, you know, it's it's really showing this year. So Gus Malzahn's going to have to, you know, start pulling some stuff out of his hat. <clears throat> Yeah, he's going to have to. They're, they're going to have to finesse it more because they just don't have the talent to push mm-hmm. up people around, especially once you are in that the thick of that SEC West mm-hmm. schedule. Absolutely. So uh, that's kind of your undercard schedule for uh, for the SEC. Kind of, you know, um, outwardly, uh, those that don't really pay attention to the conference very heavily, like I do, um, these games wouldn't look like much, but. Vanderbilt, Georgia has been competitive since Derek Mason took over uh, for the most part. Vanderbilt always comes out tough. Uh, Alabama, Arkansas is usually competitive for the first five minutes. Um, Missouri, South Carolina. Missouri is always rock solid, and so is South Carolina. So that's always a pretty good game there. And um, obviously, Auburn, Mississippi State is, I don't want to, I'm not ready to call the rivalry, but it's it's not an easy game for either team, and uh, Auburn's going into the land of the cowbell, so uh, that's going to be, you know, it's just an overblown high school game, really. All right, stadium wise, I should say. <laughs> well, Josh, uh, we are getting a a rarity this year in college football: two teams playing a home and home. <clears throat> yeah, it's like a basketball series or something. It's weird and. It's between Liberty and New Mexico State Uh, for Liberty. This will be their second straight game played in whatever New Mexico's state motto is. But, uh, yeah, they played the Lobos last time out. Uh, It's a land of enchantment, by the way, a land of enchantment. Perfect. Yeah, well, Liberty played there. I thought it was, thought it was the home of Walter White. <laughs> yeah, Josh, honestly, um, Josh, you're you're the the high school social studies teacher. You're the one who should know this. Yeah, it's New Mexico. Um, but yeah, Liberty played uh, at Lobos uh, last time out and and beat up the boys from Albuquerque pretty good. That was Liberty's second win of the season. They beat Old Dominion back in the opener. Uh, struggled a little bit those two games in between, but. Uh, Considering this is their first year at this level of football, two and two start through four, uh, nothing to laugh at. And for the Aggies, this was a team that 
somehow got off the schneid a year ago, making their first bowl game since the 50s, winning it since that bowl game. Uh, but they graduated basically everyone from that team, and they took it on the chin. They started out 0-4 and, and then uh, knocked off UTEP in a rivalry game their last time out. But like you said, Matt, this is, this is a strange one because we'll get to see this game at a later date, just over at Liberty's home stadium. Yeah, I believe and, that's the season finale for them. Yeah, and it got me thinking, you know, we, we, we sometimes see rematches in – Title games. We sometimes see rematches in now the playoffs. Um, saw a few rematches in the BCS. This is the first one in the regular season. And I'm, I'm wondering if you guys, you know, what do you think of that? Of, hey, let's say Georgia and Alabama don't play a regular season game. Why don't they schedule each other as a non-conference team? Then if they meet again, in the SEC title game, so be it. The, you know, the committees claim that they care about strength of schedule. Why not boost your schedule by getting some rematches against really, really good teams? That wouldn't be a bad idea. Although that would be uh, – the SEC has their own policy and their procedure for – uh, crossover divisional games. So. Yeah, I, I think it would be a, a, a logistical nightmare, especially because, well, the winner of that game would want it to count as a conference victory, but the loser would not. I don't know if you can have two schools that are in the same conference play a game and not consider it a conference game. You know? Well, then, we could do that well, that was, yeah. so that was one scenario that was kicking in my head. What about this scenario? Notre Dame, they're an independent. One of their biggest rival is USC. They can uh, usually count on that being a highly prestigious game. Yep. Why not play once in the Coliseum late in the season when the weather turns and once in South Bend early in the season? Now that I don't mind as much, quite frankly, especially if it's someone who's like a historic mm. rival like that. But I think that there are very few cases in which it could be a mutually beneficial situation. No so you don't see the you don't see the Aggies and the Flames stumbling on a new way of scheduling football. No, but I, more of that is just me hoping going forward that I have to see the least amount of Liberty football possible. <laughs> So, with that, uh, my second slant of the day. You know uh, who the head coach at, at there is, right? Turner Gill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The last Kansas coach that knew how to coach. <laughs> wow. I say that skeptically. Yeah. With an, un- with an upward flourish. I think he was the last coach with a, with a winning record at Buffalo before, uh, before our guy Lance Leopold got there. Well, that I will check on. So you, you can check on that while I'll get my second slam. So uh, moving to the Mountain West uh, for our trimester report card, the best story of the year far and away is Hawaii. Uh, they are off to a 5-1 and one start, including 2-0 and oh in conference. Their quarterback, Cole McDonald, leads the nation in passing touchdowns and yards. And his number one target, John Ursua, leads the nation in receiving touchdowns and yards as well. The rest of the West is relatively unknown at this point. Only Nevada and San Jose State have even played conference games. Speaking of the Spartans, they are absolutely pathetic. They're winless and you know, might be that way for the rest of the season. San Diego State is somehow 3-1 and one despite outscoring their opponents by a grand total of three points on the season. But they do boast a victory over then-ranked Arizona State. Fresno State is still very frisky. They have a resounding win over Toledo on their resume, and we all know that Toledo, you know, upper echelon MAC team. UNLV's lone FBS win came over UTEP, which, let's be frank, that's basically beating an FCS team. Not only to be frank. Nevada, meanwhile, has two solid victories under their belt over Oregon and at Air Force, but also got blown out by both Vanderbilt and those aforementioned Rockets of Toledo. Out in the Mountain Division, Boise State remains the class of the league, but they are being pushed this year by Utah State. After nearly taking out Michigan State on opening week, the Aggies have continued to look strong, albeit against very mediocre competition. Mm -hmm. They're at BYU this weekend in a very intriguing matchup uh, out there 
in the state of Utah. New Mexico's lone win against the FBS came in the Rio Grande rivalry, but the Lobos also managed to lose to that Liberty, Liberty team that Josh just talked about. Wyoming came into the season with high hopes, but have not looked good against upper-level competition so far. Uh, but the tough part of their schedule is now behind them, and they should rack up victories over the back half of the season. Colorado State's lone win this year was against a team from that state that's just north of Louisiana. I can't really put my name on it. Anyway, uh, uh, that's the only team they beat so far. Finally, though, it's been a season for to forget so far for Air Force. They've still got both legs of the Commander-in-Chief's trophy to get through, as well as some games against San Diego State and Boise State. So they need to turn it around quickly if they are going to get back to a bowl. All right, guys, with that, uh, let's move into a, our pop quiz section of the show. Take out your number two pencils. Get your blue books ready. If you remember on our recap show earlier this week, I, I mentioned in that in their victory over Utah, Washington State won a game in which they had zero rushing yards. Uh, so they had 450 passing yards, zero rushing yards in the win. This is the fourth time uh, since the turn of the century that – uh, the Cougars won a game in which they rushed for 10 or fewer yards in that same time span. since so since the year 2000, there are 19 other schools that have done the same thing. So gentlemen, your task today is to name the other 19 teams. I don't need a specific season. Just give me the school that have won a game with 10 or fewer rushing yards since 2000. And, uh, just throwing out a hint because that seems a little bit vague. There are five ACC teams, four Big Ten teams, two Big 12 teams, two Pac-12 teams, zero from the SEC, and seven from the group of five. So, uh, Josh, I will throw it out to you first. So just a point of clarification, this is specifically 10 or fewer rushing yards, not 10 or fewer yards in one specific stat category. Uh, yes, 10 or fewer rushing yards okay. in a win. So it would have been really dumb to guess Army since they had multiple wins last year with no passing yards. Correct, yes. All right. Well, I, I, I'm i totally dumbfounded because I would have guessed that Washington State doing it this year was like the first time in quite a while. So I'm just going to make an educated guess, which is stick with the Pirate. Maybe Texas Tech did it. Um, that would be a good guess. Unfortunately, no, this is actually uh, the first Mike Leach uh, coach team to have accomplished this feat. So Ooh. that is a strike. Coach. Ooh, okay. Um, so I'm going to go with, I'm going to stick in the Big 12 here. I'm going to go with uh, Okie State. Oklahoma State. Ooh, no, sorry. They have not accomplished that task. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, now I'm just trying to eliminate some teams in my head. For instance, Oregon, we think of having that air raid, but they always had a really good running back, so I feel like they they would have gotten over 10 yards. Uh, Stanford's a rushing attack. Um, Let's see. Boy, who would we find for those two Pac-12 teams? Uh, Let's see. I am going to go with a little bit of a weird one, but the Bluetooth, as I remember, like to fling the ball around. Did Arizona State ever do it? No, sorry, they did not. Ooh. Ooh. Coach. Let's see. Um... Whew. Uh, stick sticking in the Pac-12. Um, I'm going to go with the in-state rivals under Rich Rod, uh, the Arizona Wildcats. Arizona Wildcats are correct, but not under Rich Rod. Hmm. Actually, this was from back in the year 2002 uh, on my 17th birthday. In fact, um, <laughs> uh, Arizona beat Cal 52 to 41. Wow! Yeah, and in that All game. Right. In that game, they had negative five rushing yards and one for one touchdown. <laughs> nice. That's efficiency right there. All right. 
Well, that just leaves one Pac-12 team by my notes for the hint. So that's probably not a very high percentage of trying to find a team. No. So I'm going to switch tracks. I'm going to go with the conference I know the best. I'm going to go with the Big Ten. We don't have a huge history of uh, crazy passing attacks, but we do have a pretty good one with Joe Tiller. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that Purdue's on this list. Oh, sorry, Josh. No dice. Oh, my God. Am I out yet? <laughs> that is your third strike, but for this game, I'm going to extend it to six strikes because this is a much oh more case than usual. Okay. So keep it up. Uh, keep it popping. Perfect. I'll just keep randomly guessing teams. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Big 12 here because I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, I'm going to go with the Baylor Bears. Oh, that would have been my first instinct too, but no. Mm. No dice. Boy, okay. We are hustling backwards, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Josh, all right. Four. I, I'm going to give you a. Ten. I'm going to give We're you like a big, one to I'm, five. Okay. I'm going to give you guys a, a couple of Big Ten hits, Josh. Okay. Of of the four Big Ten teams, three of them are pretty much the last three you would ever think of. Um, okay. There is one that is. There is one group of five that I would think would be very obvious, giving considering how much production they've had from the quarterback position in that time span. Um, and yeah. uh, outside of that. Uh, Is the group of five team Hawaii? Yes. Okay. There we go. Hawaii won with 10 rushing yards and one touchdown against Army. In I'm on the board. In, in I'm on the board. 2010. Um, all right. I'm on the board. That's all I need. There you have it. I've made it respectable. I got my, uh, you know, I got my Ole Miss touchdown before Coach puts up 62 straight points on me. All right, Coach. (laughs) Speaking of Ole Miss, it is not Ole Miss because there's nobody from the SEC. Um, (laughs) I'm going to guess. So Baylor's not right, right? Mm -mm. Mm, I'm going to guess. I'm sure the I'm sure the Jayhawks have done it at one point. Ooh, rock chalk, no. Unfortunately, the Jayhawks have lost plenty of times without any rushing yards. They just haven't won. They haven't won. Yeah, I think that's the problem. <laughs> they won our hearts. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm going to do do the same strategy I did with going with another program for Leach, and this time go with another program for that Hawaii coach June Jones. Did SMU do it? SMU, I love that thinking, but no, unfortunately, they did not. So I'm up to five strikes? That's, that's your fourth. Uh, okay. Feels like five. We'll, we'll double check that math on that one. Okay. I feel, I feel like I've, uh, I feel like I'm going to strike 12 right now. Um, let's see. I feel like Syracuse have had to have done it with, since Dino Babers took over. No, they have not. Okay, one more guess each. You each you each have one so far. One more guess each. Winner. All right, I'm gonna out. I'm gonna throw out. Uh, I'm gonna, gonna to go totally to sudden death here. So I'm gonna totally okay. cheat, and I'm gonna throw out two names. Mm-hmm. One is I liked coaches thinking with Dino Babers. So I'm gonna go with Bowling Green. The other name I'm gonna throw out. You said that the Big Ten through the Big Ten teams were teams that I would never ever guess. Mm-hmm. So that had me thinking that it would be a team that you would assume could run the ball. And so a team that I always associate with being able to run the ball is Wisconsin. Did they have some totally crazy ass game at some point where like the quarterback got sacked so many times it took them under 10? Josh, do you remember the 2007 Capital One Bowl against Arkansas? Because in that uh, game, No, because I usually bury the lead on one of those teams. Well, because in that game, uh, the Wisconsin Badgers, led by John Stocko, <laughs> beat the team uh, with the chant of Wu Pig Suey, 17-14, to 14, with a total of negative five rushing yards. Okay. How did my Bowling Green guess do? No dice. Okay, so that's half a strike. Coach, yep. I, Coach, 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 I suggest you employ my strategy of throwing out a bunch of teams. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw out eight teams. 
<laughs> okay. Um, in the four years that my cousin was coordinator for MTSU, uh, he is kind of on that how mummy Mike Leach tree. So I'm gonna guess the Blue Raiders. Nope. He, he didn't even waste any time. He said nope. nope. I'm, uh, I'm trying to keep it snap. We got a lot of games to get to. Okay, this is gonna be super impressive. I'm gonna name all five. Just boom, 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 boom. Hit it. You, you got a uh, Chan Gailey Georgia Tech team. You got an <laughs> Elgro Virginia team. You got a Frank Beamer Virginia Tech team. You have a Steve Adazio. Boston College team, and then lastly, obviously, uh, the dude who wore a tie on the sideline for some reason, Miami did it. Boom. Uh, five for five. You don't even need to comment, Matt. I think I'm in the lead now, Coach. I actually got three for five. <laughs> uh, Frank Beamer, Virginia Tech, correct. Uh, uh, Chan Gailey, Virginia, correct. Uh, and uh, That would be Al Grove. Oh, that would <laughs> – and Steve Adazio, Boston College. I was just uh, – Coach, this is the new strategy. Just pick a bunch of teams that had crappy coaches in the 2000s. All three of those are right. Uh, <laughs> Virginia Tech beat another uh, one of the Big Ten teams who has actually done this three times. Um, beat one of the – we beat one of those teams in a bowl game uh, in 2012. Virginia in 2002 and Boston College in 2012 as well. <laughs> so, uh, so there's still two more well, ACC teams. All right. Two, two more ACC teams? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, one, one of which Coach knows intimately. Clemson? Not that intimately. <laughs> oh. Um, bullshit. Georgia Tech? Florida State. I, Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, um, man. Come on, man. So Florida State is the that is Florida. literally you have Seminole in your blood, son. So the Florida know, State but like we've we've always had good running backs. Florida State's done it twice, once in two thousand six against Miami and once in two thousand twelve against Virginia Tech. No, that's the one in two thousand twelve against Virginia Tech, they had negative fifteen rushing yards. All right. So Florida uh, Florida State is one of the last ACC team. So there's one more ACC team by my count. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna employ my shotgun policy again of just trying to hit the wall. You're just gonna name every ACC team that we haven't named so far. Yeah, but I'm gonna try and at least make it educated. North Carolina. No. I'm gonna go with it's Wake Forest. I'm gonna go with Wake Forest in no. there. No. Nope. The three overtime win. No. Nope. Indiana. No. Nope. <laughs> Indiana's not the East. Texas. No. Nope. Boise Valley. State. Uh, nope. Eastern Utah Washington. State. Okay, I am taking this pop quiz to a close. Um, you <laughs> both, Utah State. <laughs> you both failed. Teams you missed. Nevada. Uh, teams you missed. Arizona. We named Boston. I said Arizona. Yeah, Coach said okay. Arizona. Coach that was Arizona. my first guess. <laughs> okay, you're right. I, I forgot about that. Coach already said that. Anyway, Arizona. Boston Is this College, bad? It ain't good. Florida State twice. <laughs> Hawaii. Iowa. Yeah, Josh, Iowa, November thirteenth, two thousand four, at Minnesota. So I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel quite so bad now because Josh didn't get Iowa. Uh, Kansas State, <laughs> UL Monroe, Maryland twice. I said Maryland. No, you didn't. <laughs> when I, sh- I shotgunned a bunch of teams, I said Maryland. North, Northern <laughs> Illinois, <laughs> Oklahoma twice. I think uh, he already quit listening at that point. Oregon State, yeah. Pitt. I said Pitt. And the now most doing coaches strategy. The most astounding one. Rutgers three times. I had Rutgers on my list, but I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Rutgers did it twice in the same season in 2011. I had them on my list, but I felt like they were too pitiful to, to mention. Uh San yeah, Jose yeah, yeah. San Jose State, South Alabama, the Mustard Buzzards, UTEP, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Washington State four times, including the record uh, where they won a game over Arizona State with negative 38 rushing yards and one touchdown. And finally, Wisconsin. All right. Well, let's get to the more important thing. Matt saying that Turner Gill was the last Buffalo coach to be above 500. Uh, not true. He was oh. 20 and 30 up I'm, on. I meant in a single season. Oh, no, he wasn't either. They had one random season a few years ago. Uh, but, yeah, 
for the last coach to be above 500 overall at the University of Buffalo. Any guesses for the uh, years that he was there? That guy, Lance Leopold. No. Um, um, Gil Turner. <laughs> no. Jim <laughs> Chizik. And never coached at Buffalo. <laughs> now you want to wager a uh, or propose a year that this coach would have done it? I am going to guess. What am I going to guess? Um, I don't. I don't even know. Uh, Jim McNally. No. Uh, the coach that was there from 1966 to 1968, he went 18 and 12. Uh, his name was Richard Weldon, went by the nickname Doc Ulrich. So he missed out on going by Richard Weldon, but he went by the nickname Doc Ulrich. Well, no, his full name was Richard Weldon Ulrich, but he, oh. went, by, but, but he went by Doc Ulrich, which is a shame because he missed the opportunity to go by Dick Doc Ulrich. <laughs> My father's uh, favorite name, favorite nickname for a urologist. Right there. <laughs> and, and we've officially gone off the rails. Um, Wait, yeah. we were on the rails just, just then? Did you? I mean, you, you, you just heard the Boilermaker train go by. Oh, Boiler okay. up. All right. Well, Deep Roots, let's move on to the good stuff. So the game of the week is the Red River Shootout in Dallas, where Texas looks to continue their winning ways against an Oklahoma squad that, outside of their minor hiccup against Army, looks like the cream of the crop in the league. Coach, what does Texas need to do defensively in order to slow down Kyler Murray and the rest of Lincoln Riley's offense? Well, they need to find a way to, to cover C. Lamb and uh, Marquise Brown, or Hollywood Brown. Uh, so they... You know, honestly, um, I don't think they're going to have the the ploy that happened in 1999 in this matchup where Mike Leach just happened to drop his play sheet over by the Texas coaches, and it was a decoy. But, um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, they're just going to have to – they're going to have to figure out a way to to cover those intermediate zones. Uh, What Oklahoma really loves to do is they love to run a lot of short stuff and let those guys run. And then once the defense really draws up and starts to play aggressively up, uh, they like to take shots over over the top. So I think Texas just needs to go ahead and clamp down underneath so that they have to suffocate Oklahoma's offense and force them to take shots when they don't want to. And then, of course, obviously get pressure um, on Kyler Murray. I think uh, it's got to be controlled pressure. It can't be, you know, just blitz the house and hope for the best because Kyler Murray can move around. It's got to be, I I think, Kyler Murray, if you keep him condensed in a box, he's going to be one of those guys that is going to struggle to get through his reads because he really honestly hasn't had to go through his progressions because usually his first progression is wide open. So he hasn't really been forced into those reads. And so I think if you can get him onto a second, third read, um, and then put a little bit of pressure on him at that and really just make him hurry, they're going to, you're going to cause some unforced errors, uh, or you're going to cause some forced errors, I should say, uh, and, and really just kind of disrupt everything that they like to do. Uh, so I, I think you just got to lock down the intermediate, lock down the intermediate zone and just clamp down from the beginning uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously the deep stuff is, is lower percentage and they'll have to uncomfortably take those shots. Uh, Josh, Texas's defense, I think, has taken a, a step forward, at least this year, in terms of consistently consistency. They rank in the upper half of most of the metrics. Uh, so do you see that being the only way they can stay in this game? Because quite frankly, I don't really love Texas' offense. Uh, no, because let's see who that defense has gone against. Uh, TCU, well, they've put up 17 points against Iowa State. They've proven to be a little overrated. They held Kansas State to 14 points. Kansas State has no offense. USC has no offense. So, uh, well done, Texas. You're coming back to earth. Because if there's one thing I do while on this show, it's always assume Oklahoma is going to destroy Texas and Oklahoma State. And that's a pretty re- reliable formula. They they normally clean at least one of those teams' clocks, if not both of them. 
All right. Well, do you have any other insight into this one, Josh? Or do you think it's just going to be Oklahoma all the way? No, I, I don't. I don't concern myself with Tom Herman's team. All right then. Well, uh, let's move then to uh, uh, the Big Ten, where coming off of a huge win in Happy Valley last weekend, Tom Herman was the GA when that stuff happened with uh, Mike Leach. Just saying. Well, he also was the uh, former offensive coordinator of Ohio State, who are hosting Indiana this weekend. Uh, they shouldn't be looking past the Hoosiers, though. Uh, they're 25th in the country in total defense and have done a very nice job forcing turnovers. So, Josh, can Tom Allen's crew hang tough against the Buckeyes, or it's going to be another typical Ohio State blowout? You know, there's a lot to like about this Indiana team. I think that Tom Allen's taking what was a surprisingly decent foundation by previous regime, Kevin Wilson, and has really built on it, especially by – incorporating a defensive identity. But this Hoosier team is just they're, – they're struggling on the offensive side of the ball. And it's tough to really fully pin down what all is happening because they're not, they're not consistently getting explosive running plays. And then the passing game is doing a lot of dink and dunks. And it, it's just like – they look like a car that's a stick shift with someone who doesn't quite know how to drive stick. Like they're kind of lurching and there's a few times where they get into gear, but it just hasn't been consistent. I think last week is a really good example of that. Um, that first half, they looked amazing against Rutgers. Rutgers got up seven, nothing. And then the Hoosiers ripped off 24 straight points. They're up 24 to seven at halftime. And you're going, okay, Hoosiers run away with this thing. And then they were held scoreless in the second half. And it's, I think the defense is finally in the same zip code as a team that could have upset aspirations. But this year's Hoosier offense just is not getting it done. So I, you know, I think Ohio State can't be sleepwalking, um, but I don't think it's as scary a team as some of those Kevin Wilson. Hoosier teams where you're like, oh, boy, they're, they're going to put up 35 points on us. Yeah, uh, Coach, you know, obviously we, we've seen Ohio State look, you know, pretty pretty darn good uh, the first part of the season. Sure. And uh, Dwayne Haskins in his first year as a starter, is he doing anything in particular that impresses you, uh, that, uh, you know, makes him stand out above, you know, former Ohio State quarterbacks, thinking, you know, JT Barrett, Ter- Terrell Pryor, et cetera? No, I don't think he's doing anything extraordinarily different. I just think he's – managing the offense and, uh, you know, managing them to uh, fourth nationally in total yards per game, 557, and pass efficiency, uh, sixth in the in scoring, 49 points a game, and eighth in passing overall uh, with 346.6 yards per game. So, I mean, he, he's just – he's taking care of the football. He's accurate. He's efficient. And he's a running threat as well. So, uh, I mean, he's, he's just doing everything extremely well at this point. Um, I don't know how long that will last, but you know, they just, you know, he's just kind of the kind of the head of that uh, offense that also features J.K. Dobbins and Mike Weber in the running game. So you can't necessarily key in on Dwayne Haskins. So again, uh, nothing extraordinarily different. He's just he's another. Urban Meyer quarterback that just is kind of just really good at everything. Yeah, I think he looks a little bit more adept as a passer than than Barrett ever really did. But yeah. let's um, let, let's move on then to the SEC. And after emerging victorious in the Dan Mullen Bowl, Florida returns home to the Swamp to host LSU. The Tigers have been better than advertised this season. Much of that has to do with the emergence of Joe Burrow, the transfer quarterback from Ohio State. So, Coach, how can Burrow find success against a Florida team that, you know, really shut down Mississippi State last week? Uh, honestly, I, I think it was a little bit of fool's gold. Um, you know, I think Florida's really good up front. Uh, the, the best part of their defense is up front. Um, but, you know, they get after you. Um, but it just – I honestly, they, all, all Joe Burrow needs to do is just show up. And show up on time. I mean, they have Nick Brosette, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, they have Justin Jefferson, um, they have guys that can go get it everywhere uh, across the board. And, you know, I, I think Florida, you know, I, I think they kind of sort of struggled defensively, even against Tennessee, which is hard to say. If Tennessee doesn't cough up the ball six times, I think it's, uh, I think it's 
going in Tennessee's favor. Um, you know, I think they were just the beneficiaries of Tennessee playing extremely crappy. So um, I really haven't seen a whole lot that I could be impressed with with Florida. Um, this could potentially be a game where they make a statement. Um, they're, they're on a three-game winning streak somehow. So they're four and one, they're two and one, they're doing something right. Uh, I just think it's a little bit of fool's gold at, at this point. And, and I think, honestly, LSU is going to come out. Uh, LSU is firing all cylinders, and Joe Burrow is quickly emerging. Uh, he's quickly putting himself at the top of that list of, of the best quarterbacks in that conference, which um, outside of Drew Locke, uh, Jake Fromm, and Joe Burrow, that list just significantly takes a drop. Um, really, well, I, mean, I, I think Kyle Schrammer, too. To say about that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and Kellen Mond. And Kellen Mond. And really, the, the conference, is, is it's got a bad rap as far as quarterbacks go. Um, so <laughs> yeah, The quarterback in play has improved this year. But, Josh, you know, Florida's offense still only scored, scored 13 points last week, and their touch, only touchdown came on a, on a trick play. So, And I think LSU's defense is, you know, a couple steps up from Mississippi State. So, I mean, we all know that Dave Rand is a pretty darn good coordinator down there for the Bayou Bengals. So any, any chance that Florida's going to be able to move the ball? Well, I think they'll be able to move the ball in non-conventional ways. You mentioned the trick play. Um, They also currently have the most efficient special teams in the SEC, ninth in the country. That's a metric that measures all the various kicking, return, all that stuff, uh, and, and spits out a number for how you're stacking up with that. And what's helping Florida is... They are the tenth best team right now in punt returns. Um, that's second in the SEC, or excuse me, third in the SEC. So they're hanging their own there. Um, that's the best in the SEC East. So you know when they get those stops, they might be able to to rip off a few plays. Um, maybe instead of having to go a seventy yard drive, their special teams could turn that into maybe like a sixty yard drive make things a little bit more manageable from that. Uh, the other thing that they're doing that I like, um, I, I know Coach hammered Felipe Franks on our, our last show, and you know I'm not going to say he's <laughs> emerging. It, he's still uh, a young kid. He's still developing. But I, what I really like so far this year is he's being efficient when Florida gets into scoring position. And that's really reflected in already having 12 touchdowns on the young season to just three interceptions. So, you know, he's doing well deep in in enemy territory. I think if he can limit those, keep limiting those mistakes, especially against LSU's defense, uh, Florida's got a chance. And Dan Mullen, we all like him. And I think the reason we all like him is – he inexplicably won a bunch of games at Mississippi State doing a lot of smoke and mirrors and wringing as much out of a you know a program that's tough to get talent there as possible. And we're seeing some of that characteristics already at Florida. But it'll be really interesting to see what Florida's like when he starts recruiting. Um, so I think it would be naive to – say they have no chance at home with as good a coach as Dan Mullen um, with doing some nice things defensively, doing some really nice things, special teams. I think at the end of the day, it's not going to be enough, but I think Florida can hang in this game and and don't be surprised if you see the score in in the third quarter, something kind of ugly, like 14 to nine, where like Florida's gotten three long field goals to hang in the game and, and, LSU scored twice, but then like maybe LSU's had some bad turnover luck, things like that. I think Florida can kind of hang around and, you know, for them to be ranked already at this point in Dan Mullen's time there, they have to be pretty excited. And if they, I think if you told them that you'll be in a game in the second half against the top five team, they'll take that in Mullen's first season. 
Yeah. Well, uh, let's stay in the SEC for our next game. Uh, Texas A&M will host Kentucky this weekend in a game between two of the more surprising teams in the conference. We all know about Benny Snell. So, Coach, my question for you is, what will Kentucky's defense need to do in order to stop Kellen Mon from running amok like he did at times against Clemson and some other teams this year? Ooh, that'll that'll be more of a challenge, I think, than uh... – you know, than, than, than we think, you know, Kentucky's defense has been playing tremendously um, all season long. And they, you know, they've already, you know, they've already had some, some victories under their belt that, yeah, I mean, they're number two in the country in pass efficiency defense. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess the guy you could uh, on their schedule that you could closely, I'm not going to say exactly compare them to, but I mean, the type of player that Kellamond is and the type of player that Felipe Franks is, you know, their style, not necessarily their production, but their style is, is pretty similar. So, um, and they did a good job of, of kind of just disrupting what he does. So, again, they're just going to ha- kind of have to treat it like, you know, keep him in contain, you know, box him in, you know, force him, uh, get him on the run, you know, get some hits on him, hurry him, you know, just get some pressure on him. Um you know, and, and really just kind of make him uncomfortable and, and, and really just try to throw on the run a little bit. And Is he the kind of guy that you want to, like, devote a spy to at all times or just, like, certain situations or because of his scramble ability? I think certain situations. I, I think you've got to mix it up on him. I think he's still um, – I don't think he has enough experience to, uh, to really dissect uh, as much as he will in the near future – um, as he gains this experience, but, um, you know, keep a spy on him some, uh, you know, bluff him some, you know, bring pressure, uh, drop eight sometimes, you know, just, just mix some things up and, and have some good, clever, uh, pressure packages that puts a lot of, puts a lot of, uh, issue on the offensive line because, you know, A and M is, you know, they're not going to be in a whole lot of uh, seven man protection. And if you can force them into seven man protection, because you're getting pressure on the quarterback, then that kind of plays into your hands as a defense, because A&M is, is a type of high octane team that likes to, that likes to get out there and put guys in routes. And, and if they can, if, if Texas A&M is able to beat you in five man and, and, and six man protections, then it's going to be a long day for Kentucky. Uh, but if Kentucky can, can contain Kellen Mon, uh, make him run around and make him let go of the ball on the run. I haven't seen too much of, of him throwing on the run. I've either seen him uh, scramble, uh, set up and throw, or I've seen him scramble and, and, and get a bunch of yards. So if they could just eliminate the big chunk plays and make him uh, make him make plays from the pocket and make him take, you know, three, four, five, six yard gains at a time and, and really rack up the number of plays per drive for him. I, I have a feeling they can force him into an error that he doesn't want to make because also, again, uh, a lot of his scoring drives are the shorter, bigger chunk play uh, drives where uh, they, they, they chunk yardage down there and either get a field goal or even get in the end zone. So, um, so yeah. All right, Josh. Well, I mentioned Benny Snell in – the intro to this game. So my question to you then is, you know, how does Texas A&M stop Benny Snell and the rest of that Kentucky rush offense? Well, I'm going to steal something that coach likes to say, and that is they need to just keep doing what they've been doing. Uh, I don't think people necessarily realize how good this A&M rush defense has been. It's top 10 nationally. It's ninth in the country. They're holding opponents to just a tick over three yards per carry. They've only given up five rushing Touchdowns. This uh, this might be over dramatic, but it could be the make or break game in any potential Heisman Trophy campaign for Benny Snell. You know, if he can go off against a top ten rush defense, get a huge road victory as Kentucky tries to uh, keep a little bit of fire to the feet of uh, coaches' dogs, but that could make his campaign. If he gets bottled up, if A and M beats up on beats up on Kentucky, maybe it maybe it ends really before it starts. But, um, you know, I just want to echo something Coach mentioned, which was, uh, you know, Kentucky trying to stop Kellen Mond. Kellen Mond had uh, two interceptions last time out against that really lackluster win against uh, some random team from Arkansas. Uh, I believe it was uh, Arkansas, the University of Arkansas Monticello Bull Weevils. Perfect. That's what it was. Um, 
But yes, yeah, so you know, Kellen Mond just he's amazing. We could see it. His arm strength, accuracy, all that stuff, his feet, he is a really special quarterback, but he's still young. This is only his second year as a starter, still sometimes has questionable decision making. And for Kentucky, they only have the 42nd best pass defense in the country. That's above average, but it's still not amazing. But they do have six interceptions on the young season. They do have 12 sacks on the young season. So, you know, I think this is going to come down really to Kentucky's pass defense because A&M's rush defense is a proven commodity. All right. Well, uh, for our last deep route then, let's head over to Blacksburg for a matchup between the Hokies and Notre Dame. Both of these teams are coming off of impressive wins last week. That's especially true for Virginia Tech, who won handily in their first game without starting quarterback Josh Jackson. Josh, do you expect the Irish to have any sort of letdown after their victory over Stanford last week? Well, if they do have a letdown, it'll be because Virginia Tech uh, puts in another defensive performance like they did their opening week with Florida State, where it seemed like they could get a sack at will. Uh, But Notre Dame's offensive line has been playing a lot better as of late, Um, looking pretty good. You know, if there's one thing that you want to say that could potentially – lead to a hangover might just be leaving the state of Indiana. Notre Dame's only had one road game and it was down at Wake Forest. No disrespect to the Demon Deacons, but that's not exactly like walking into Lane Stadium when Enter Sandman's blasting. You know those Hokie fans are going to be crazy. So um, if there's a letdown, I'm not going to be convinced it's because of a hangover. I might be more convinced that it's just Virginia Tech has at times this year looked really, really good. Yeah, Coach, uh, you know, obviously Virginia Tech had to break in a new quarterback last week by necessity. Notre Dame broke in a new one by choice in Ian Book, and he looked outstanding. Now, obviously, you know, Stanford, pretty good defense. So can you do it again against Virginia Tech? Yeah, I think he can. I mean, I don't think it's any fluke. You watch him play. He looked very comfortable back there and uh, looked like the his teammates really responded well to him. So, um, you know, to be honest with you, he, he does a lot of good things. I mean, he's not going to jump out of the page. I don't think he's necessarily elite. I just think he works um, for what Notre Dame wants him to do. And I think he's more than a game manager, less than an elite. I think he's, I think he's a perfect fit for, for what Notre Dame likes to do. And uh, he's just extremely efficient. Uh, he can run when he has to. He's not a run first guy, obviously, but he can make yards when he has to when stuff breaks down. And, you know, he's just a good leader uh, of those guys. And he's somebody that um, understands what Brian Kelly wants. I almost said Chip Kelly. Uh, understand what Brian Kelly wants and understands um, how to make this Notre Dame offense go. And, and he's he's been very good. So um, the real test, though, you mentioned it, is really going to be um, – Ryan Willis from Kansas um, and, and how he's going to come in and, and lead this Hokie offense uh, while Josh Jackson is still um, still injured. So um, Willis, he had 332 yards passing last week, but um, he's going against Notre Dame this week. So it'll be a matter of, you know, what can Notre Dame do to make him as uncomfortable as they possibly can. And uh, they're going to do everything in their power to ensure this. So um, if, if they don't get any help in the run game and if they don't if they don't get any help by their defense, this could be a long night for Virginia for, for Virginia Tech. And the only exciting thing that happens uh, Saturday night potentially is inner sandman. So um you know, I, I hope this is a good competitive game just for the sake of college football. Um, but I'm just not confident that without Josh Jackson, I I don't think this Virginia Tech offense can be as efficient against a team like Notre Dame as, as they were last week with uh, when he, when he lit up uh, for 332 yards. So um, honestly, I think it's going to be a long day for, for Virginia tech. uh, And it's going to be some long, long goes at it, rough goes at it until they get Josh Jackson back. All right. Well, from there, let's hit some spread formations. We all went two and four last week on the season, all below 500. I'm in the lead somehow. Yeah. 15. Coach, you're 9 and 17. Josh, you are a robust 8 and 18. It's fine, though, because I have told myself that I am not going to 
turn things around until Rutgers can turn things around. Well, we'll get to those Scarlet Knights here in a little bit. It's a sign of solidarity, so, yeah. Well, let's start in the ACC. NC State are five-point favorites at home against BC. So, uh, Coach, I'm going to go to you first this week. We went for Josh first last week on these. Who are you taking? You know what? This is a really hard one to pick uh, because you got A.J. Dillon uh, just tearing the – tearing it up uh, in the rushing attack, but BC just hasn't looked like they did at the start of the season. So I'm going to go with the NC State Wolfpack and Ryan Finley. Josh. Well, on top of that, you know, BC's defense, just not vintage. They're they're 79th in the nation in points allowed and that affirmation to AJ Dillon game time decision. So I'll go with the pack as well. Yeah, that's that's my biggest concern, obviously, is uh, the uh, health of A.J. Dillon. Without him, they become super one-dimensional. Anthony Brown, I still like him as a quarterback, um, but, uh, you know, still uh, – they're going to become completely one-dimensional. NC State's already very good against the run. They're 19th in the country. So I'm going to have to go with the Wolfpack as well. Uh, right. Uh, sticking in the ACC, Pitt has been, you know, uh, I don't think it's quite been living up to the standards that I at least had set for them. This weekend, they're three and a half point home dogs against a Syracuse team that gave Clemson everything it could handle last weekend. So, Coach, how do you feel about the orange on the road? Ooh, the orange on the road at Pitt. I, I like them on the road. Uh, they, they, ch- they were not afraid of the Death Valley environment. Uh, they didn't come out victorious at Clemson, but they threw their best punch. And I think if they throw their best punch against Pitt, they're going to win. I think they're going to more than cover this three and a half point spread. Josh. So you mentioned if D'Antonio was in the hot seat, I think we need to be very concerned about a coach that you and I really like, Matt, because Narduzzi's a defensive mind. They're 97th this year and points against Mm -hmm. they gave up 38 points somehow to a bad North Carolina team Uh, central Florida had no problem racking up almost half a hundred on them. And to add to the misery of having no defense, putrid offense, 106th and points for 119th and passing. They just cannot get, anything going and Syracuse quite frankly looks like the second best team in the ACC I think the Q's romp all right uh for me the thing I'm worried about with Pitt is not just the fact that their defense is not good they're also stepping on their own toes a ton they average eight penalties for 76 yards per game I mean those are both in you know the bottom 20 bottom 20 of the country that is not a good look. So uh, I do like Narduzzi, and I still believe him as a coach going forward. But, man, it's it's not the greatest season there out in western Pennsylvania. So I am also going to go with the team of my youth, the Syracuse Orange. Uh, heading out to the Pac-12, Stanford and Utah, both coming off of tough losses on the road last week. This weekend they face off against each other on the farm in Palo Alto. Coach, Stanford, five-point favorites at home. What side are you on? Ooh, uh, knowing what I know about Utah uh, and knowing what I know coming into the season about Utah, we were saying defense is – they're one of the best, better defenses in the Pac-12. Um, they are proving that um, they are not the team we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. Um I think Stanford's going to cover this. Uh, they just got too much firepower for Utah. Utah um, had a hard time with Washington State. I think Stanford is um, – I think they are um, better than Washington State, and I think they're more balanced and they're more efficient. They, they got Bryce Love. Um, he's going to have a big day. They got uh, K.J. Costello. He's going to have a big day. They got Jaws, who as a result is going to have a big day. They have Colby Parkinson, who um, – I don't think there's many people in the Pac-12, or there might not be many people nationwide that could cover Colby Parkinson. Um, so they're going to have to figure that out. They're going to figure that monster out and try to figure out how to how to stop all all of those elements. And they're going to have a hard time with that. 
and thus they are going to lose by more than the five-point spread, especially on the road. Josh? Yeah, something's not right in the water for Utah because they cannot find ways to finish drives. We talked about it in that Washington game, ton of empty trips to the red zone. Their defense is killing it. They're giving up just 16 points per game. That's 14th best in the nation. And if there's something wrong in the water at Utah, you have to also highlight there's something wrong in the water with Stanford. Their offensive line didn't look very good last week. They can't get Bryce Love going. I'm not sure Utah gets off the schneid, but I could see them hanging tight and losing by three or four points again. I'm actually going to take the points. Just uh, There's something not right about either of these teams, but the Utah defense is for sure the only thing that I trust about all the units on the field right now. Yeah, I, I'm with you there, Josh. Like I said, I've said it on this podcast this season, I don't know how many times, I picked Utah at the beginning of the season. They're behind the eight ball right now. They need a win, and they know it. I like them to cover here as well. So let's head then to the first leg of the Commander and Chiefs trophy. Uh, that's taking place this weekend in Colorado Springs. The Falcons welcome the Middies to their home turf. Navy three-point favorite on the road. Coach, who are you taking? Ooh, now this will be a fun one to watch uh, because you know, the game will be over in about twenty-five minutes. I don't know if you blink, you miss it. Um, the question is going to be: Can Navy handle? Well, they can handle the altitude because they've handled it before, so uh, that's not an issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and dispel that uh, notion. Um, I, I just think Navy's tradition of winning and and kind of where they are overall as a program. Um, I think this is one of the games where. I'm going to say it. You ready for it? Culture, where the culture comes into play. And I think Navy has, out of the three uh, out of the three surface academies, I still think they have the best overall program. Navy, or Army, excuse me, is, nipping at, is starting to nip at their heels, and Army is starting to catch up. I think Army is closer to Navy than Air Force is closer to Navy, and I think Navy does more uh, with the triple option attack than than, uh, than Air Force, and I think Navy's going to be victorious on the road here. Um, they're going to cover. Uh, they're going to win. They're going to cover, and uh, they'll probably win by a touchdown because they don't have time to, to, to build a double double or two or three touchdown lead. So, All right, uh, Josh, how do you feel about this one? Well, this one's a weird one because – on one hand, you could construct an argument saying, hey, look, Navy just had bad luck against SMU. They were a couple plays away from being 3-1, and one, and that loss at Hawaii doesn't look very bad now that Hawaii strung a bunch of wins together. And then you could say, well, the Air Force is winless against FBS teams, so the Falcons aren't any good. But Navy's really struggling defensively. And that SMU game... It was pretty jarring how well a bad SMU team with one of the worst offensive lines in the country manufactured points. Um, but I'm I'm in agreement with Coach. Navy's not right this year yet, but just program to program, they're deeper than Air Force. They'll know Air Force's offense so well since they basically run the same thing. I think the middies get back a little bit on track this week. But, um, you know, I, I'm more curious about how Navy looks later this month when they have that Temple and Houston games. Well, you know, I I, I usually would be taking uh, Navy in this one. But Air Force is, you know, despite their – you know, their one and three record, 0 and three against uh, FBS competition. If you look at their losses, they're not that bad. At Florida Atlantic, you know, that, you know, FAU is a pretty solid team. At Utah State, I already discussed Utah State. They are a very good team this year. They lost last week to Nevada in a close one, but I think Nevada's offense is kind of funky. Air Force is also very good against the run. They are 12th in the country, giving up less than 100 yards per game on the ground. I see 
you know, Navy has not looked good away from home this year. I like Air Force at home, actually. So I'm going to grab the the three points and go with the Falcons. So uh, next, guys, I don't say this very often, but the Fighting Illini are favorites on the road in a conference game. And since I sent you the line yesterday, it's gone up another point in Illinois' favor. So now, how could this possibly happen, do you ask? Well, the answer is Rutgers. Scarlet Knights are now getting five and a half at home against Illinois. So, Coach, any chance that my dear father's alma mater can pull off the upset? No, it's 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 getting it's bad and getting worse. Um, Illinois, uh, this is the um, this is the slump buster for them, and uh, I think they're going to cover this thing. I would be highly shocked. I'll, I'll come on here and uh, what, whatever the saying is about eating crow, uh, I will eat. I will eat tons of crow. I'll put barbecue sauce on it. It'll taste good. Illinois is going to roll. Josh. Yeah, Lovey's team has had some visible, tangible improvement. They, you know, they gave up a million yards to South Florida, but their defense was doing some really good bending but not breaking, standing tall when it mattered. Uh, they only lost that game by six, and it, it was kind of a, whoa, like, the game was closer than expected. And then against Penn State, they were up 24-21 at one point. The fourth quarter got away from them. Agreed. It happens. They're they're still trying to build, but through three quarters, they were giving Penn State basically all they could handle. And Illinois has had now a bye week to get ready for a terrible Rutgers team. I think Penn. I think Illinois is kind of sitting there, and if I'm Lovey Smith, I, I'm hammering this home. Like, hey, we're a couple plays away from beating the Bulls. We we should be a three and one team. We got Rutgers. We got Purdue coming up. We rip off these two two wins. We're at four wins with plenty of shots to get to a bowl game. I think they feel like they're playing for something still. And Rutgers is about dead. I mean, like, I don't know how many more demoralizing losses you could take. They, they played by far their best game of the year. And Indiana just sort of was shrugging and like, whatever. Like, the Hoosiers honestly looked like they were looking past Rutgers. So this is a really long way to say that I'm with Coach. I think Illinois covers this. The only thing as jarring, like bad and outlandish as Rutgers' team is Lovey Smith's beard. Uh, this is not a – I don't want to say not a vintage – I mean, this in many ways is a vintage Rutgers team. They are terrible. So, uh, yeah, no, no way that Illinois wins by less than a touchdown here. So time for our favorite uh, ga- time of the week, and that means time to look and bet the ridiculous Kansas line for the weekend. Our beloved Jayhawks are on the road this weekend in Morgantown. Did a little recon, no track in the stadium in, uh, at West Virginia. So uh, Kansas 28.5-point underdogs, Coach, who are you taking in this epic Big 12 battle? <laughs> oh, God. I th- This line is so – you know, Vegas has a way of, like, really just, like, drawing you in. Like, ooh, I might – you know, they see this 20-and-a-half point spread. They're like, we're going to try to get some action on Kansas. Well, guess what, Vegas? I'm not buying it. West Virginia is going to beat you by 40. I'm taking the Mountaineers in case you – we're wondering. Mm-hmm. Josh? Well, here's some interesting news about West Virginia. Go on. They, they burn couches. <laughs> well, in addition to doing that, um, they haven't been slaughtering teams. Um, the last two weeks, they held on against Texas Tech, 42-34, against Kansas State, 35-6. to I said it on the recap show earlier this week. West Virginia feels like they're hitting that annual Dana Holgerson conference slide where things just don't go their way. Kansas put up some points against Oklahoma State. They have a running back that I think can uh, 
can help get them some points. Uh, Puka Williams Jr., he's got 474 yards on the young season. Put up 163 in that huge win against Rutgers. So with a spread this big, you just need Kansas to find 14 points, and it gets really difficult to cover it. So I'm going to go with Kansas. Uh and here I was thinking I was going to be the only guy on the Jayhawk bandwagon. <laughs> but no. You know I'm boys with David Beatty. I never leave the Kansas bandwagon. No. Uh, uh, Kansas is still number one in the country in turnover margin, uh, by the yeah, way. Baby. Uh, it they, helps that they had, I believe, 32 against Rutgers. Something like that. And, you know, uh, they're, at, you know, they're allowing only, you know, 202 yards passing per game. I know, I know they haven't faced an offense that is even where, anywhere close to the caliber of uh, West Virginia. And, you know, the only team that would be comparable would be Oklahoma State, who they played last week and gave up 48 to. But Oklahoma State this year is, is more of a balanced team. And I just, I don't think, I, we saw West Virginia's defense get a little bit exposed in the second half last week against uh, when Texas Tech had to uh, move to having uh, the new quarterback in and, you know, running the ball more, and they weren't quite prepared for it. I think that Kansas can keep it within four touchdowns. So rock shock. All right, Josh. Well, with that, any final words? Yeah, I think we uh, we buried one of the bigger games of the season um, over in the SEC. I, I man, this one this looks like an all timer, you guys, because Alabama, quite frankly, has not looked very good on the road in their road game this season so far uh, down at Mississippi. They let the Rebs just pass all over them. The Rebs raced out to that huge. 7 nothing lead, and then Alabama kind of struggled to get into gear. Uh, I, I know by the end of it, Alabama had, had put up a workman like 62 points. But just felt like the tide were never in gear. I, I'm not sure this team can handle Fayetteville. Arkansas playing extremely well at home where they are 1-2. and two. Um, they, they gave a and all they could handle. Probably should have had that game, just a few – mistakes like on the opening kickoff but the Razorbacks they look like they're peaking and in Alabama I mean this is a marathon not a sprint and I think they might have peaked too early Alabama's probably going to be a little tired and so Arkansas huge upset wait for it if Arkansas is even within the five touchdown spread it will be a victory for them uh yes <laughs> agreed coach final words from you I don't know how to top that, so I'm not going to try. All right. Well, uh, in that case, uh, it's time for us to end our week six preview for 2018. So on behalf of the coach, Corey Burton, here in Nashville, Tennessee, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in Chicago, this is the professor in Nashville. Say so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. What? Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion.